Um, well, thank you, Ken, and uh, hopefully everybody can hear me loud and clear from uh, here at home in, in Hobbiton, um, or uh, more accurately in uh, just outside of Cambridge. Um, and uh, 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 Jeremy Sustard, who uh, will be presenting with me today, will be will be kicking off our presentation. Uh, Jeremy uh, runs his own company, Creative Aid, as well as uh, working with us here and helping us with uh, with a bunch of the stuff that we do. Um, I thought I'd take a minute to tell you about Rosier Systems, uh, who we are and what we do. Um, we're a software company that focuses entirely on agriculture. Uh, we came out of, myself and my colleagues came out of uh, Ag Research, uh, New Zealand's agricultural research organisation a number of years ago. Um, and we have a passion for creating uh, technology, software and data systems that help agribusinesses to be more profitable uh, and more sustainable and that, that's our mission and that's what we're here for. We've got a team of about 40 staff um, who are all working from home at the moment um, and uh, uh, we're looking forward to sharing with you a little bit about some of our design process that we use with customers uh, and really hoping that you can pick some of this up and, and uh, uh, take it away for yourself and, and make some, some good use of that. So Jeremy, I'm gonna um, uh, ask you to introduce yourself as well and, and kick this off. Fantastic, uh, hopefully I'm unmuted and everything's working well. Uh, my name's Jeremy, I live in Karapiro, so just outside of Cambridge as well, um, and I've had the privilege of working alongside Razier and a few other clients uh, in the field of design and, and innovation. And we're, we're excited to still be presenting here. Um, well, what was going to happen is we were going to be running an interactive workshop at the end of uh, mobile tech. So we're going to still try and make things a little bit interactive today. So at the bottom of your screen there, hopefully you'll be able to see um, two little panels there. There's a chat panel where we're going to ask you at some stage um, for some feedback. We'd, we'd love it if you could write your answers there in the chat panel and Andrew will be monitoring those. And if during the presentation you also have some questions around um, what we're talking about and perhaps some the practices or how this might work for you, there's another little button there, uh, Q&A, and if you click in there and put your question in, uh, for the last 15 minutes, we'll have a chance to go through those, and if we run out of time, um, we'll make sure we can email you as well. But hold on, it's going to be a bit of a fast ride. Andrew says I talk a lot and I talk fast, so uh, hold on, and hopefully you'll be able to, to keep up. But I, I really want to start today, um, we want to tell you a story of, of two products, right? The story of two products, and the first of these is this lovely pixelated picture of Crafty. Crafty was an app that actually I was part of developing. This was back in probably around 2012 and 13. Me and my mate, and my best friend, just had this amazing idea. And we thought, how cool would it be to create an app for the craft beer industry? So it means people could find new craft brews to be trying, the craft brewers could be communicating with their public. Great idea. So we had this idea and we thought, let's go. So we used uh, Ruby on Rails. Uh, we got into some of the coding. I can't code, so I was kind of contacting the brewers and trying to work things out. It was fantastic. We made this kind of um, uh, mobile web app, so it could work on Android and on iOS. We're very excited with our idea. You can see, if you think I'm making this all up, there's me with a little bit more hair next to my good friend Jamie there when we were launching it. So we got promotions and people were excited about our idea. We launched it and we got about 100 downloads. Uh, that was about it, our energy ran out. People didn't really seem to like the idea. It used cool technology and we thought it was really funky, but it just flopped, okay? So this is product number one. And then I wanna introduce you to product number two. And first of all, this is not it. This is not product number two. This is my beautiful daughter, Sophie, who's almost seven months old. And um, when we had Sophie, we got to experience the wonderful joys of feeding, okay? And with feeding, you know, we were going those middle of the night feeds, they were becoming a little bit frustrating. And then we heard of this product that we wanted to try. And this is a product, you can see it here, it's called the Tommy Tippy. And we were excited because we were like, this is a machine that's gonna make milk for us. So in the middle of the night, we push a button and milk will come out, it'll be amazing. So we went and bought ourselves a Tommy Tippy. And to be honest, at first we were really, really disappointed because it didn't put milk out. All it does is you put formula in a bottle and it puts out the right amount of hot water and then the right amount of cold water. And we were like, that's not a great idea. But you know what? After we actually started using the Tommy Tippy, we discovered that this was solving a problem we didn't even know we had. 
this Tommy Tippy now is absolutely indispensable in our household. We honestly, if we travel anywhere, the first thing we're packing is the Tommy Tippy because it just makes feeding our lovely daughter an absolute breeze. And we understand that the designers of the Tommy Tippy, they actually understood the problem of feeding a child. They weren't just sold by this idea, they really understood the problem, okay? So two products here, Crafty and Tommy Tippy, but with two big differences. See, Crafty started with an idea. Started with an idea that me and my mate had that we thought would be cool, and it flopped. Whereas when you look at the story of Tommy Tippy, that didn't start with an idea, that started with a problem. An understanding of going, how can we make parents' life easier when growing their children, right? So often, we found in New, in New Zealand and around the world with innovation, this is kind of an informal uh, framework or process that we have. You might go to a cool conference like this and get a great idea. You might be talking with some of your team and having a fantastic idea, but it starts with an idea. And then what happens is you get excited about that. So you go, let's build something and let's test it. And then really the third step is you hope. <laughs> you hope something will happen. I've worked with organizations which have used this framework fairly unsuccessfully and spent a lot of money and a lot of time on big, big ideas. And so often this is the process that people uh, informally in the mental models they have. But the truth is when you look into the research around innovation and you guys as practitioners of innovation, you know this innovation is hard, hard work. Um, Clayton Christensen, who's a Harvard Business School professor who passed away just a couple of months ago, his research over decades on innovation suggested that innovation failure rates are somewhere between 80 to 85% which means um, investments or time spent on innovation and innovative of new products, normally only about 15 to 20% of them ever actually make it to market. And often uh, the trip up is right back there at the beginning where people start with an idea. See, we've discovered and found uh, that really, if you wanna be a great innovator, what you need to do is you need to be someone who loves problems before you love products, right? What tends to happen is we can be people who fall in love with ideas and we fall in love with products, but we forget about the problem we're actually trying to solve. Because the truth is your users, your customers, the people you partner with, they have problems. They need those problems solved and your job is to help them solve those problems. And a focus on products, what we've discovered is often it means you forget about the person who has the problem. So you need to keep the problem front and center in your innovation journey because that means you're keeping your people front and center. So a way to do this is you need a better process than that simple one I put up before of going, well, how can you actually create valuable solutions to real problems? And it can be a simple, simple process here, but we need to have one of these to work through, okay? And co-design, or you might have heard of this as design thinking, human-centered designs, these are all kind of similar frameworks and similar processes to create solutions to real problems. We wanna emphasize, this is a process, it's not a cure-all, okay? It's still a hard, hard work. Uh, this kind of came out of Stanford in the 1960s. You might've seen our IDEO working in this space and Better by Design in New Zealand, but this co-design process is incredibly valuable and helpful for you to be keeping focused on problems and people and not getting swept up with your ideas. So co-design is simply this, it's the act of creating with your stakeholders and with your users, not creating for them, but creating with them. So it's recognizing that perhaps the people who are actually facing the problem day by day have just as good an understanding or perhaps even a better understanding of the problem than you do. So it's this movement um, philosophically and in your practice to designing for people where you're um, kind of like uh, siloed away from them to designing with people, with users. Now this is a rigorous process. We're not talking about out just throwing post-it notes around and wearing wigs to try and become creative. This also embraces business smarts. There's a lot of academic rigor behind this process, but what it's really trying to do is uncover what are the key problems you're trying to solve. And once you know those, how can you craft the best fit solutions? Okay. If, if you need some numbers to try and convince you with this, the research that's been done over the last five years, um, we'll go through this really, really quickly, but it just suggests that when you co-design with your users, and both Andrew and I have discovered this, is it leads to more loyal and satisfied customers. Your users delight in being asked to design products along with you, okay? This idea that you have to keep everything secret for them or they won't like it if they're testing things that fail is not true. They love it if they can be involved with this. Co-design is also a process that gets product to market quicker and cheaper, often with less iterations because you're testing as you go. 
It improves workplace culture because you get to have your entire team involved working alongside problem solving of your customer, not perhaps just marketing. And also McKinsey's and Co's report, which we'd highly suggest you go and check out. Uh, you just go Google McKinsey and Co design thinking. Um, but this talks about how design driven companies who really embrace this generate higher revenue and return to their shareholders. A classic example of this is the Cleveland Clinic, um, the big hospital in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and this is an organization that had very, very low patient success scores. Okay, so they actually promoted a senior surgeon, he was in his 60s, to being their head of experience, okay? And his job was actually to get the, hosp the hospital thinking patients first. What are the patients' problems? So the first thing he did was he admitted himself as a patient for a weekend. So he came in, he was put in a wheelchair and then put on a bed, and he started to actually experience life as a patient. You know what he discovered? Some of the insights included that you spend about 80 to 90% of your time as a patient looking at the roof <laughs> and thinking about how do we use this roof space, realizing that a lot of the time when doctors were sitting down with people, they weren't able to make eye contact with them. So they started looking at life in the patient. Now, if you go and work at the Cleveland Clinic as a doctor, you actually have to be admitted for 24 hours as a patient. They have lots of little ideas where lots of forms you used to have to fill in paper. They said, why can't we just fill these in in line and speed things up? Um, also, if you've got a too long a wait there, waiting for more than 30 minutes, you get a free coffee. Just these little things like this that make their patient success scores a lot, lot higher. So this is what we're going to be talking about today, this co-design process. You may have seen something like this before. Uh, it's traditionally a five-step process. You can look into this in your own time, but it starts with empathy, not with an idea, but with empathy, which means feeling the problem, okay, from those users who actually encounter the problem every day. So it's going into their world, seeking to understand them, then moving into what we call the define stage. Once you've talked to all these people, it's going, okay, what's the problem behind the problem we're actually trying to solve here? What What's the key problem that we're trying to solve? Moving into ideation, which we won't really talk about too much today. Ideation is the process of generating lots and lots of potential solutions. It's, it recognizes that your best ideas come from the combination of lots of good ideas. And then from there, where we will be talking today is actually how do you prototype and test? How do you build cheap and fast ways to test your best solutions in this, okay? So where we're starting with this is innovation journeys, they often they start with a hunch. So you have that moment where you go, huh, wonder what would happen if we did this? You know, you might get an idea from mobile tech, like I said, you might be talking to your teammate, and you just have a hunch going, there might be an opportunity, or here's a cool idea. And what we're encouraging you to do is when you get that feeling and that little light bulb going bing over your head, what we want you to do is first of all move from idea to problem. And it feels like you're taking a step backwards, okay? But we want you to be thinking, what is the problem you're actually trying to solve? Both Andrew and I have discovered this is actually a real fun little thing to do with your team as well. Sit with your team sometime and just go, before we start this meeting, what's the problem we're actually trying to solve here? And see the huge range of answers that come up. And as you're doing this, moving from idea to problem, you want to start considering who would be useful stakeholders or that's the big people's word, who would be useful people to actually be involved in this design process. So let's say you're, you've got a hunch. We've come up with two hunches for you. So I'm sorry, these are the hunches you're going to be working with today. Let's say you're sitting there going, it'd be awesome if there was a drone with a camera on it and it had an app so we could quite, kind of automate our pasture management decisions and it would send me decision-making software, which would be fantastic so I'd know what to do. Or maybe a drone that flies over waterways, takes photos, and it helps measure nutrient concentration. So let's say these are the two hunches you have okay here's your first chance we're going to be doing some chat here so get ready what's the problem so we'll give you about a minute we'd love you just to put in here Andrew will be reading these out live as they come in what's the problem that these are trying to solve so I'll go back to the slide so you can see it okay but what is the problem behind this hunch over to you Andrew Great, thanks Jeremy. Um, so just uh, use the chat icon down the bottom of the screen and if there are, uh, um, you might have to make up something, right? You might be looking at these and going, I can't think of any real problem that you could be trying to solve here, but, but, but let's make something up. Um, uh, okay, so Gideon has suggested terrain issues. Yeah, absolutely. That, that could be well be something you're trying to solve if you're flying a drone over. Um, yeah, Stephen says, as a farmer, it takes him ages to get to the back of the farm to measure nutrients. So, so this, this could be perfect. Um, Jason says, people don't like doing pasture measurements. And yeah, I completely agree. That would be a classic. Uh, Harry says, micro versus macro, macro versus micro views, right? So you can see down 
the ground, but what about the big picture? Uh, Jennifer, again, same thing, time commitment. It takes a long time. You can spend a whole day walking, um, uh, doing a pasture walk over a reasonable size farm. Yeah, ah, Stephen says, I want to increase my yields. Now that's a different, different answer to the time sort of question, isn't it? Yeah. Fantastic. Great response, people. And you've got another chance coming up in a second as well. But hopefully you can see when you jump ahead with a hunch, there's lots of possible problems you're trying to solve, which you don't understand. And here's the other big kicker. Sometimes you don't even know that they are problems. You're just guessing they are. Okay. So what I'll ask you to do now is uh, for our next slide, if you were going to go ahead with either one of these two, who might be some stakeholders or people that would be wise to talk to? Now, there's one really obvious one, okay? Hopefully, I'm sure you guys will get that. But also think a little bit wider. Who would be some other people who might be wise to talk to as you explore this? So use that chat. I'll go back to that slide as well. Either one of these ideas, who would be some people who would be wise to talk to? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And don't just tell me your software developers or your um, <laughs> drone manufacturers. There'll be some others. Who else would you be wise to talk to if you really want to kind of learn about your hunch? Ah, okay. So Sophie says, beef and lamb, ag research, dairy and dead. So people who've been trying to solve this. Yeah, Ernie says, someone who's tried to solve the problem and failed. Man, you can learn so much from them. Absolutely. Um, Hamish and Stephen both say farmers and their staff. Yeah, the people who actually have to go and, and do it. At, ah, Stephen says councils. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jackie says, uh, scientists, local authorities, checking water quality. Ah, uh, yes, and here's another suggestion. CAA. <laughs> Am I allowed to have drones flying around by themselves, maybe out of sight if it's down the back of the farm? Yes, a CAA, absolutely. Regional councils, potential users. Soil testers, so people who are trying to establish nutrients now. Fantastic. That's great. And another one might even be drone enthusiasts. So people who do fly these, they might be able to tell you some of the stuff you hadn't thought about. Um, and even it can be interesting talking to people who seem like they have a very left field view on this. So for example, local iwi could be fascinating to talk to, to see their view and their perspective on this. Mm -hmm. So once you've kind of got this, these ideas of people you need to talk to, what we need to have is conversations with these people. This isn't going, hey, can I you do a survey monkey or anything like this? It's actually sitting down and chatting with them, having a cup of tea. Because what you need to do is you need to understand their world and their problem. You guys did a fantastic job highlighting that some of these problems could be around time. So how do they actually use that time when they're walking to the back of the farm? doing those new, it might actually be that that's a key part of their day when they're making other observations. And that's not a problem. That's actually a real valuable part of their day. I don't know. You need to understand their world even better is walking with them and saying, can you please show me how you make these measurements? Show me what you do. You don't just ask them what they want because that's not how you have a good conversation, right? But you want to ask questions to get stories and experiences from them and then observe and inquire. Now, this is something that really, if you want to do it well, you have to go into their world. And so some little tips as you're doing this, and before I go into these tips, both Andrew and I wanna say, the way you get better at doing this is by doing it. Like one of the things I often tell people is your worst empathy interview will be your first one. And that's okay. After that, you get better and better. And you're really just learning to have a conversation with people, right? But what you want to do is you want to avoid closed questions, which are questions that can just be answered by a yes or no. Okay. So do you like measuring the water, water nutrients runoffs? Yes, no, not a great question, but questions that start with, hey, can you tell me about a time? They're great. So can you tell me about a time uh, when you had to measure, measure your, your, your uh, pasture growth? Can you tell me what that was like? What would you do? Walk me through it. And if they say something you don't understand, just say, oh, why did you do that? Fantastic follow-up question. If you never know what to say, just ask, why did you do that? And good questions we've discovered, they often start with a what. Okay, so what do you use when you're doing this or a how? Well, how do you make that decision? So going, you could show, show me how you make pasture management decisions, you know, or can you tell me about a struggle you've had making a decision recently? These are just sample questions that you can be having there to make sure you're going to be having a good conversation around this. And what you need to be doing as you're having these conversations is taking notes. And we have learned this, the richer the notes, the better. 
okay? So capturing quotes, capturing what these people are saying in their own words is fantastic. You might use big post-it notes, that's kind of classic. I think Andrew uses um, a, a notepad and writes these down. But one of the things we always say is you wanna write at least eight to 15 words per insight, okay? So if that person had said, oh, I'm happy with the current process, don't just write happy. Because you're gonna get back and look at that and be like, what does that mean, right? But if you say they're happy with the current process because it's been utilized for decades, that's an insight, right? It tells you about how they're learning their processes. It tells you about changing processes and it starts to tell you about the value of these processes. So we'll go to Andrew now. Andrew, you might be able to provide some real world ex uh, example of what this has actually looked like for Rosier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you're right, Jeremy, when I go and do this sort of work, um, I take with me uh, my notebook. I don't know if you can see that. It's probably getting cropped out by the virtual background. Uh, and I, I take with me Sharpie and Post-it notes. Um, and uh, uh, look, my preference actually is I sit with my notebook and, uh, and ideally when we do this, do you want to flip to the next slide, Jeremy? We, um, uh, there'll be two of us who go out. So, so as an example, we were doing this exercise with a, uh, uh, a New Zealand agri-tech company um, uh, about a product idea that they had um, and I thought was pretty cool. Um, we split our team, so we actually had, had six of us who were in our team trying to figure out what we we're going to build, what it might look like. We split into pairs. We went and visited farmers on farm rather than getting them to come to us. Um, we, some of them we met and stood in the field, others we sat at the kitchen table, which has the, the bonus of getting whatever morning tea or afternoon tea is going, so that's always a, a bonus. Um, and, and, and um, my preference is we, we take turns asking questions, but I'm always trying to write down and it's far easier to write if you're not the person asking questions. I'm trying to capture some of, some of their actual things that they say, because sometimes the actual quote that the farmer or somebody else says, that's the gold, you know, it really defines better than any kind of summary I could write. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to capture. Look, my, my, in this case, it was clear that we had this hunch of what would be really good for them. The farmers knew who we were coming on behalf of, so they tried to show interest into what we were asking about. But really, it was actually something adjacent that was much more interesting. There are other things that were more valuable, and the great learning for this company was those things were on their roadmap, but they were on their roadmap for later on and they actually could bring those things forward because that was obviously the area that was most valuable to the farmers and we got some really interesting insights. Fantastic. And, and I mean, that highlights something as well. Don't go in there saying, hey, we've got this idea for this product. What do you think about it? Because A, that's just becoming a sales meeting and New Zealanders on the whole just tend to be quite polite. They just go, oh, that sounds amazing. That's really, really good. That's not your job at this stage. Your job is just to understand their world and this problem that you're exploring. Okay. So you're not going in to test a product or anything like this. Another thing that Andrew said there, which I just want to highlight, he talked about going um, and, you know, with six people splitting up and going and peers is fantastic and if you can take people who will also be building the products it is great so this is not just the job for your marketing team it can be a job for you know um, coders developers if they're introverts and scared that's okay um, often this is a scary process but people warm into it and it pays dividends when they're actually further down the line building these products for these people so after you've kind of talked to all these people, what you can imagine you've got is a lot of insights. On that last slide, Andrew just showed us just a, a fraction of some of the insights they captured from a few different people here. And what you need to do now is make sense of all of these insights, okay? And we talk about um, these reframing them as how might we questions. So trying to understand what's the problem behind the problem. Does that make sense? You've got a bit of a hunch or a problem that you're going to go explore, but after you've talked to all these people, you often have more of an idea of what this problem actually is, of making sense of it, okay? So this is that understand stage because these conversations, they always lead to surprises when you're talking to users. They always lead to surprises to these key moments where what, what they actually determine is valuable. And so this stage is about making sense of some of the surprises you had, those insights you had, maybe even disappointments when you're going, oh, I thought that was the problem but it's not and information you've discovered um, so you might discover what we call hinge problems which are just the little problems that they your solution absolutely needs to solve 
So for example, in going, going out here, this is a, a silly example, but you might discover that 50% of your customers just don't have Wi-Fi coverage or, um, or data coverage over the farm, right? That's an incredible insight. So that's a little hinge problem that if you don't solve that as part of your solution, the entire thing will fall over. You'll discover gaps in your idea, right? And this happens all the time, as we'll see in Andrew's example. There's always gaps, right? Where you discover, oh my goodness, I didn't realize that we actually need to solve this and this together, not just this part. The exciting flip part of this is you discover new opportunities and you discover critical success factors. And what do we mean by this is you discover what your product or your service, your solution, what it has to deliver in terms of value for these people. And it's putting up those critical success factors in the terms of your user, okay? So here's a quick example of how you can do this. This is um, one you can see, you can just imagine if you had these different post it notes all scattered around there. Little technique you can use once you've kind of got these hundreds of post it notes is a little technique called affinity mapping. Affinity is a word that just means like. So you're just mapping things whether they're like each other or not. It's incredibly simple, but incredibly powerful. And the real value is in the conversations. So what you do is you do this with at least one other person. You get all your post it notes or all your data insights out and you pick one up and you read it out loud. And then you pick up another one at random and you read it out loud and you ask yourself, are these two saying the same thing or are they saying something different? If they're saying the same thing, you stick them together so they're on top of each other like this. If they're different, you put them down at different parts of the table, then you pick up another one and read it out and you ask each other, you gotta be thinking out loud so you're kind of giving each other a glimpse into your thoughts. You start moving post-its around and forming these clusters. So it might start looking something like this at the end. The great thing about post-it notes is you can re-stick them. So once you put them down on the table, it doesn't mean you, they have to stay there for the rest of their lives. You can pick them up, you can have debate amongst your team about what people are saying, but you start to discover these clusters from what your users were saying. The final step there is to name these clusters and you start discovering some themes here, okay? Themes about what people have been talking about and this is what leads you on um, to great, great understandings of your customers and of their real problems, okay? So Andrew might give us an example now of what this is like for Rizia. Yeah, absolutely, Jeremy. Do you want to just uh, flick over to that uh, next slide? So um, uh, this, this is uh, a, a case where we, we did some work helping a UK customer with their thinking. And uh, I'm kind of doing a little sneaky blend here of a couple of, of customers from the UK. We did a couple of really interesting projects that Julian Gairdner and I, and some of you will know Julian, who used to, um, used to be here as part of uh, NZX Agri and, and, uh, and then PGW. Uh, we, we ran a number of workshops uh, for customers uh, and we went out and we talked to a whole bunch of farmers um, and um, with some of the team from the customer business um, and some real insights again into, um, uh, gosh, I almost felt like we were doing a, needing to do a bit of social work there. Some of the farmers were under such pressure and trying to deal with some really gnarly issues. Um, and so we came back with a wide range of potential areas where these customers could help the farmers. Uh, and so uh, we and the team did this sort of dump and we actually, we, we did it in a few stages. We, we, after each set of interviews, we did this over a couple of days, we'd come back and we'd write out as many post-it notes as we could about what we'd learned from that farmer. And then we just kind of dumped them on one of these um, boards uh, in the room and um, we did that over a couple of days and then on the third day we got together with the team and we did this affinity mapping and uh, really tried to pull together uh, some of the uh, some of the themes and so what you can see on the, the slide is on the left hand side there's Simon and there's Sam probably too blurry for you to read but there were some learnings from some of those those customers and then on the right hand side you can see the team is actually doing the affinity mapping so they're pulling these things out coming up with some themes and, and actually out of those, we also did a bit of prioritization. So there were some of these that were more attractive to the business to solve and work on than others. Um, and so, so some of that prioritization happened. And we also ended up writing, and I don't think we've talked about it yet, Jeremy, but writing some, some new how might we questions. Because we, we had a how might we question that kind of summed up our, our hunch. It was kind of a how might we solve this problem. But we ended up writing a bunch of new questions that the business thought that they could actually tackle. 
Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's not always easy. The, these these bits here, you can see. I wish there were no gaps. I wish I had more ideas on how to solve the gaps. That's from working with another customer. But we've done some of this work, and we realised that even with all of that, there were some gaps in the sort of process we might need to try and solve the, these customer problems that we didn't have a clear idea of how we were going to solve. So it's it's not always easy, you know. Sometimes you identify actually hard problems that that aren't as as, as amenable to throwing a digital solution at as you might hope. Yeah, I, I've found often that doing this affinity mapping process, it's simple, but it's not easy. <laughs> it's a simple process and it leads to incredible uh, insights and conversations, um, but it is not an easy process. And so at the end of this, this is what Andrew was just talking about, is you, re you result with these new how might we questions. You can get the names of those clusters you've created and often you can just add how might we to the front of it and you're putting what they have been saying uh, in their own words into a problem. So for example, we're just dreaming here after doing our uh, empathy interviews, our new how might we question might be, how might we help farmers predict environmental or financial outcomes from making pasture management decisions? So suddenly our how might we, it's not about a product or an app at all, it's actually about a problem. And at this stage, this is where you'd wanna also uh, feed it back to the farmers and say, this is what we think we're hearing from you. Does this capture, right? And so this is a very key part of this stage. So next step is ideation. We're not going to be talking too much around this, but this is where you're coming up with a whole bunch of potential solutions, okay? Um, there's heaps of different ideation techniques out there. You can Google this, but one of the golden rules with ideation, um, just two quick tips perhaps, is first of all, your first idea is very rarely your best idea. So make sure you keep scraping your brain to get more ideas and consider how you can um, mash them together. And if you're doing this with a team, one of the best tips we can give you is start off individually brainstorming and then come together. Don't get your team together and say, who's got an idea? Because the first idea that comes out will set the scope and set the direction of every other idea. Whereas if you ask people in your team, can you come up with 10 ideas and then we'll meet and talk about them? It's a great way to work on this ideation stage. But then we're gonna talk about building and uh, we're gonna, we've got some interactivity coming up. So get your fingers ready to be typing because what we're wanting to build is a solution that lives at the heart of this kind of Venn diagram. What great solutions do is they, they tick three boxes. First of all, with this human values box around desirability or usability, okay? This is what people just wanting to use your, um, wanting to use your solution, wanting to, that, to use what you've come up with and something that's actually really gonna be something that will solve their problem, okay? And so this is what the, empathy interviews, for example, are really trying to get into, okay? So a solution has to be desirable and usable, okay? And this is often where most innovations unfortunately fall down. If you start with an idea and don't talk to people, it will almost definitely fall down at this stage. But people can't just love them. There also needs to be viability there, which means you need to actually have a business model behind this, right? It needs to be something that can create profit and uh, deliver a healthy return on investment to your shareholders. So a solution also has to be viable. And then obviously, the third one, your, your idea has to be feasible. So your solution has to be something you can actually deliver, both with your own capabilities, but also just with the technological cap capabilities of um, the world you're operating in. So what I'd like you to do, first of all, could anyone suggest um, some possible innovations or products or solutions? They might have gone to market, but perhaps they struggled. Well, first of all, do that they missed out on the top one. So they didn't have that desirability or that usability from people. It could be from the ag industry, um, or it could just be from the wider world, some innovation. So we've got any that have come in yet, Andrew? Not yet. Uh, who's no. gonna be first? Who's gonna be first? I can give an example whilst people are typing if we want. A great example around this would be Google Glass. If you remember those glasses that Google created, they had the technology to work on them, they had a business model, people didn't like them. So they absolutely flopped. All right, how are we going people? Uh, and it's, it's probably worth saying these don't have to be, oh, Stephen says disc players, mini disc players. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What were you gonna say then, Andrew? Oh, I was gonna say it doesn't have to be your own thing. It might be just something that you noticed. So don't feel like you have to kind of put your hand up and say, oh, well, we had this idea and it flopped. So this would be where Crafty, my uh, my wonderful app that I created in 2013, absolutely fell down. We had a business model, we had the technology, nobody liked our idea. 
QR codes. Now, that's an interesting one because I think there are a whole bunch of spaces where QR codes have been successful and an equal bunch of spaces where people thought they were going to be successful. QR codes on products in the supermarkets that nobody's got time in the supermarket to, to look up every item and check the provenance of it using a QR code. Um, technology worked, sort of, but... but uh, but desirability, just not there. Gordon, the Sinclair C3. I'm drawing a blank on that one, Andrew. <laughs> oh, it's, a, it's a UK computer, if I remember rightly, and I, I'm just struggling to remember where it fits as well. Um, the, t the TiVo, do you remember that? The, the uh -huh. TiVo, everyone was going to record their, their TV and watch it later. Now, of course, we watch on demand instead. Mm -hmm. Uh, the technology was quite complex to use, if I remember rightly. So it really worked. It just had bad UI, UX. We've got one more coming, maybe, Andrew? Oh, there's a, there's a few <laughs> that are charging through now. Uh, the plastic, plastic packaging for the Rocket Apples. Uh, people, lots of people who fronted up at Dragon's Den. Um, <laughs> Jerry, I, Jerry, I'm not sure I'll read you one about Nate, but you know, definitely there's a there's a there's a need there, um, but there are some definitely some usability problems and maybe even some business business viability problems too. So, so for the sake of time, we'll um, we perhaps we won't get feedback because I just looked at the clock and I've done what I always do. But then um, sometimes solutions as well, uh, people love them. And there's feasibility there, but the business model behind them uh, has a bit of a question mark around this. Um, Uber is an example of this. We'll see what happens with Uber, but that's a company that is continually just bleeding money and almost searching for a business model uh, to make profit or perhaps just waiting for self-driving cars. Uh, and then the other one is uh, if you just don't have the technological feasibility around this, where perhaps, uh, for example, you might sit there and go uh, hologram lecturers or hologram um, salespeople who can beam into your home. Fantastic. It might have a great business model for scalability. People might love it, but we just don't have the tech to do that yet. So it's important to find that sweet spot, okay? Finding what people love, where there's a business, and what you can actually deliver. And we think the easiest way in is to start with using this co-design co as a way to get in uh, to those human values and understand what people love, because that is often cheap and fast to understand, and it's where most innovations fall down, okay? And so to get to that sweet spot, it's important to build things that people can use. So once you've got your idea and you're wanting to test this, this is a key thing, is you're going to be building a prototype for people to test, not to sell. Your idea is not to spend months and months building something so people are amazed by it. Your idea is to build something fast, as quickly as possible, so people can test it, so you can see, is it actually desirable and is it usable for these people? And um, you've probably heard of minimum viable product. I found this diagram very helpful in this. When you're creating a minimum viable product, really what you're trying to do is not on the left-hand side of the screen, which is a product that just functions, right, at the barest minimum level. What you're wanting to do is create a prototype that actually cuts across all four of these. You want it to work and deliver that, but you need it to also show some value. And the example that Andrew's going to show in a second will prove that. It's got to be something that's also usable as well, so people can get it in their hands and play with it. And ideally, the best prototypes are also delightful. And what we mean by that is when people are using them, they're smiling, or people are recognizing, my goodness, this is going to make my life easier. So when you're building these prototypes, we want to be clear, you can build, let's say the best solution we've come up with for, for our idea is around an app. So let's pretend it's a digital solution for our process today. You can quickly build this with paper. I'm no coder, I'm not a computer guy, but I can draw an app on a piece of paper and put it in people's hands and say, what would you do next? Where would you do it? And it's a quick way to do it. The next step with that is there are some wonderful quick apps you can download like Pop, which is a way to quickly turn post-it notes and drawings into workable little apps for people to prototype. From there, if you've got a bit more capability, you can build wireframes. And each stage, as we're building higher and higher resolution prototypes, we're testing. We're testing them with people, we're discovering insights, and we're iterating. So Andrew, um, love to throw back to you if you want to chat about what this has looked like for Razier. Yeah, absolutely. And if you just click through to the next slide, Jeremy. So um, look, here's an example of some work that we were doing uh, uh, in Australia. But actually, but maybe before I talk about that, and, and I don't know whether the, the particular New Zealand customer is in the audience today, but um, you know we had one case where 
we mocked something up and it was really interesting to watch the uh, face of the customer because they they said um, oh man this is really great and we were kind of all smiling because they were smiling uh, and then they said I could give this away to all of my customers and we kind of went oh because that would have destroyed our business model. So uh, great usability, poor business feasibility. Um, but look, here, here's, here's some, some uh, sale yards uh, in Australia. And um, like most people, you're probably on uh, COVID-19 lockdown at the moment. But um, you can see the auctioneer up there on the stand above the stock, um, uh, calling out, looking for the next bid. And beside him, on uh, probably on your right, is the, the spotter looking for who's bidding. Uh, and then there's two people on the left, both of them with, with clipboards, and those are the, the clerks taking down for each pen, for each lot within the pen, who bought what, at what price, all of those sorts of details, uh, which is great, but you don't get the results of those clipboards back until the end of the sale, and by then people are trying to take animals away, nobody's processed stuff, so how do you, how do you digitize this to make it more useful? So on the next slide, Here's, here's the prototype that we came up with. Um, and what you can see is it's on, it's on one of these big orange uh, post-it notes um, and it's stuck onto one of my diaries um, to give it the kind of weight as though this was a tablet. So this is a tablet app and you can feel it like it's a tablet. Uh, and uh, the pages of the post-it notes, you know, we've got multiple stuck there, you can turn them to see what would happen if you press one of the buttons. Um, and so a user can interact with that and we can, well, what would you do next? And so they particularly liked the fact that um, there was only kind of three fields to fill in. They could type in the price, a buyer code, which is in two pieces for them, and then just press save and next and they're on to the next lot, which is about the length of time, about 15 seconds that they've got before they start the next lot. So that's our low res prototype. And on the next page is the, high res prototype. Now this is still not software, right? This is just something that our UX designer has mocked up um, that kind of pulls together some of these same sorts of things, um, made up data, but of the same sort of sort uh, uh, that we can, and, and we could display that. Our designer's got a nice uh, 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 Adobe Creative Studio app that lets us kind of look at this stuff. But we've done similar things just in PowerPoint and displayed it on a tablet and have people click through uh, and pop does the same sort of thing. So um, quick, uh, a few minutes for the paper prototype, uh, a couple of hours for the, the high res one rather than days actually coding something. Fantastic. The great thing about this is you can tell is you get it in the hands of people really, really quickly. And uh, you also discover the buttons that they're not pressing or the information they're not looking at and suddenly start to recognize, hey, perhaps we can simplify this. And part of the value we're offering is reducing. Okay. So what and, we're and probably the other, sorry, Jeremy, the other thing that's really useful is if you discover you've gone down completely the wrong track, your investment on the paper prototype was a few minutes. It's easy to throw that out and do that again. Even on this one, it's only a couple of hours at the most. So, so um, low level investment, low attachment. And so you can easily go, oh, we got that wrong. Let's try something different. Andrew, quick question I'll ask um, if that's okay. Because a lot of the time when I work with clients as well, they think I don't want to put a post-it note like this, uh, you know, when I'm working with a client in the hand of a user. Won't that make us look like we're just a rubbish company if this is what we're doing? How have you found people when they've been able to play with paper prototypes? Um, well, so two things. I do a bit of expectations management up front. So if I'm working with farmers or other people, um, I will tend to say, hey, we're using these pro paper prototypes because it lets us get the ideas through quickly and learn. Um, but I want you to suspend your kind of um, any critical analysis and pretend that this is an app or an application. And actually, most people can do that fairly well. We don't, and what we don't want them to do is we don't want them to critique the user interface design and being hand sketched sort of takes that away. We want them to pretend they're using it. And so that, that is helpful. Fantastic. So what we just encourage you to do, we're at 1.46, so we've gone 60 seconds over time. We've got to have some time for Q&A. As we'd encourage you with this, um, first of all, try having conversations with customers. And under this lockdown world where you can't go and meet with them, um, having a virtual conversation or having a Zoom with them is great. 
sitting there to ask them questions about their world and about this problem you're exploring. Um, we would say coffee plus questions plus listening equals magic. You might not be able to have those coffees with them at this stage, but it's very, very rare when you get someone from your organization to sit down with a user to ask some questions and have a conversation. It's very rare uh, if you don't walk away being blown away with some of the insights that have come up with this. We'd encourage you not to sell your ideas, but to really understand your problem. So if there's a big takeaway from here, it's just recognize this, that when you have an idea, try and think backwards to the problem and then think, who can I talk to? to start working through that journey. And finally, if you're feeling bold, you might wanna invite one to three, what we call extreme users to help you create a solution. So an extreme users, they are the ones who are at either end. So what this would be at one end, it might be people who are absolute fans of your company, of your products. They love everything you do. Getting them involved can be great right through to non-customers, to people who don't use your products or your services at all. Getting together with them and asking them to help you create a solution can be a fantastic way going forward. Um, that's me. I'm going to throw to Andrew for some final words and then have a chance for um, to maybe dig into some of this Q&A. So over to you, Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thanks for that, Jeremy. And and look, I'm hoping that this has been useful to you and, um, and not just sort of stuff that you've heard before. Um, even if there's one or two little things that you take away and you think, yeah, I'm going to do that. Um, then that's really valuable, hopefully. I've put up a link on the slide there, um, reza.re, rezia, um, slash mt20, um, mobile tech 20. Um, that, that will just take you to a page where you can give us some feedback and say, hey, found this interesting, wish you didn't cover that. Um, hey, we'd love to learn more about X. I'm not going to do a big sale on you. I'm just really keen to get some feedback um, to improve how we do this as well. So, so it's part of our, our learning uh, as well. Um, and, uh, and, and yes, also very keen to, uh, to share out, I think the slides and the, the video will be available after, after this. Um, I don't see any questions in the Q&A, but if you do have some questions, just uh, uh, tap them into the Q&A or actually tap them into the chat. That'll be fine. We're watching both. Uh, what would be your advice to achieve this from the customer point of view? Uh, Megan, I'm interested in, in, uh, in which 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 bit you're, you're, you're asking that in relation to. Um, for, for ourselves and our customers, um, we often, so our customers tend to be people who are trying to create products and services for agriculture. We don't, we don't sell our own products to, to farmers, for instance. Um, what I say to our customers is, it's worthwhile setting some time aside at an early stage of your project, while it's still at that kind of hunch idea before you've built the full business case to do some of this prototyping and learning. You're not gonna create the screens that you're actually gonna implement. You're going to create some stuff that lets you test the idea. But then we also encourage our customers to do this repeatedly through their development process as well. It's what Google would call dual track design, which says each time you've got a bit of a gnarly problem to solve or some new set of functionality you wanna to add to your app, even existing app, try some of this process again, uh, because you always want to be not just kind of, not just looking at the data and saying, hey, we know our customers now, we know what will work for them, but actually, again, test and learn and, and do, do this exact same process again. Okay, so there's a couple more questions come through. Um, one is, I've got a simple idea. Uh, I'm not a programmer. Uh, what's the best way to approach an app developer without disclosing my idea? Yeah, that's tricky. Um, I tend to say there's two things. One is, when you're first looking for developers, you're looking for capability and you're looking for their empathy. In other words, are they people you could work with? So probably you're gonna be asking them lots of questions, uh, telling them a bit about your business rather than your idea and seeing whether this, they're the sort of people who you could work with. But you're gonna to have to come to a point where you are gonna share your idea. Now, again, when customers approach us, they come with 
often a non-disclosure agreement. You can find plenty of those on the web or you can get your lawyer to draft one for you. Um, and that helps. Uh, but the other thing is an idea is often only an idea and you'll tend to find that most, particularly most contract development houses, they're not interested in your idea. They've got no route to market for your idea. Um, and so they're not going to steal your idea. Um, so you probably, you know, you're probably fine to talk to them in hypothetical terms to start with, even without the idea. Uh, how do you handle co-design in an academic context where the project needs to be pre-designed when the bid is written up? It's a huge struggle. And hey, the same thing applies any case where you're getting funding. Um, Julian Gardner and I were just talking about how to do this when we were working with a customer who's applying for funding in the UK. Uh, and how do you do that? Well, you can design some of these activities into your project plan, right? So that's a good starting point. Um, but you're probably going to need to do some of it at the low resolution, free time investment level to kind of take your hunch to the next stage before you even write your application. And that, again, that's, that's painful, I know, because it's an investment of time and potentially money. But maybe you can do it on the cheap, but maybe you only need to talk to two or three farmers or whoever your audience members are to just get a bit of a, you know, even if you did some of the empathy work without doing all the rest of the ideation and prototyping, that might be enough before you write your application. And um, Carly, I'd also say on that, um, that also actually strengthens applications. If you can be showing that you've um, done some early stage validation by talking to people and um, can put in some of that VOC, voice of the customer or voice of the end user, um, we found in an academic context that strengthens um, applications for bids. Um, and then also, uh, in, in another side, co-design uh, design thinking is actually a growing academic field. And um, many uh, governments, for example, especially the, the UK government, government in a lot of settings, are um, increasingly favorable to co-design. And so I think what, like what Andrew was saying, if you can be clear around saying, um, these are where our outputs are, this is what we're going to, you still know what some of your outputs will be. We're going to be engaging with this user base. We're going to be designing a best fit solution, but we're going to be engaging in co-design to improve our chance of a best fit solution. Uh, many, many um, academic areas and governments are actually quite favorable to this. And there's a huge body of work online um, where this is being explored in an academic uh, realm where you can be referencing, et cetera. And perhaps the one thing I'd add to that, Jeremy, um, just from my uh, experience writing some of these proposals is um, uh, it depends where you're getting your funding from and whether it's for pure R&D funding as well. Mm. Um, so, uh, so if you do, you dare not position this as market research if this is R&D funding because it just won't fly. But co-design is quite a different activity, even though the, the things you're doing are very similar. Um, Stephen's saying, who should innovators typically go to for support on business feasibility? Look, people will complain about it, but I really encourage talk to Callahan Innovation and your regional business partners. Um, uh, they do tend to, so sometimes they will tend to push you down an, an R&D route, but often, and particularly the regional business partners are very good at this, they'll say, well, it sounds like you need to explore this, and they'll make some introductions to people you should talk to. Or they will suggest that, um, look, there's a voucher that you can use to get somebody to help you with some of this research. So uh, well, worth, well worth doing, I think, in terms of just looking at some of that business feasibility. Um, the, other, the other people would be experienced entrepreneurs and what you're wanting to learn off them is they're thinking about how do they evaluate feasibility. So rather than saying, would you fund this? You're saying, when you, when you had a hunch and a project idea, how did you evaluate whether you could build a business out of it? And just listening to them. Look, fantastic. Thank you, Jeremy. Anything you want to add as we, as we wrap we just up? Got, we just got one last question from Megan there, um, right at the bottom. Uh, so can you tell me about a time that an idea or a prototype stage has been a complete flop? <laughs> You're wanting a Titanic story at the end of this and how you worked with the client to recover. Uh, I'll let you go to that one, Andrew. <laughs> Oh, look, and look, I've, I've, let's be honest here, yeah, I've had a mixture of experiences. So we've had somewhere, uh, we, we had a great session of empathy. So we learned a lot about the customer and the needs and, um, and the potential 
and we came up with an idea and we prototyped the idea and it was clear that farmers were being polite. It was very lukewarm. In fact, lukewarm is probably over optimistic. And at that point, you've learned a lot. It's a flop. You're not going to go and build what you, you've prototyped because it clearly wasn't meeting the need. But man, just think about the time you, time and money you have saved by not building that from your hunch. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, I, what I would say is that's a great opportunity to regroup and say, okay, and we've done this with a couple of customers, let's go back and see what was the next idea in our set of ideas. Because if you've done your ideation process really well, then what you've got is you've got potentially hundreds of ideas and you've probably got two or three really good candidates that you chose one of to prototype. So go back to the next one. And I think I'll just, I'll just add, um, it can't flop if you fall in love with problems, but if you fall in love with ideas, it can. So, I mean, a quick story. I worked with a client once, this was in the healthcare sector, where unfortunately they'd fallen in love with an idea and they were investing a lot of money into it. And I said, let's go test this. Let's go test your idea, get a quick prototype. Uh, went and tested it with some doctors at, at a big hospital and very quickly discovered that this idea was just not going to fly. It wasn't going to fit into their workflow. It was failing on a hinge problem around time. Um, went back and, you know, delivered this news to them and they were disappointed but didn't believe me. And in that case, they carried on and the whole business flopped. So it was a flop. Whereas if they'd been really working to solve a problem, that would not have been a flop. That would have been an incredibly valuable insight to actually work with, right? But unfortunately, because they'd fallen in love with this idea and not with the problem, there was nothing I could do to try and help them recover in that, in that situation, no matter how much you say, look at your users, this is what they're saying, here's evidence of it, so what can we do with this? Um, if they're gonna keep soldiering on, that's when it will lead to a complete flop, unfortunately. Ouch. Yeah. Good learnings, Jeremy. Hey, um, Time-wise, we probably better wrap up there. Um, happy to take more questions via that feedback link that you can see on the screen in front of you. And we're going to hand back over to Ken now, who's got a couple of wrap-up things before the, the next event.